Thank you for joining us for this discussion and for um, watching you. this clip with us. I, think and we're all, I do hope yeah, that was a good here. way to entice you to watch the whole series. Um, it will begin airing on your local PBS station in about 25 minutes. So hopefully you'll join, you'll continue this conversation with us and then watch it online later. Um, it's a four part series and it airs this week and next week. Um, as we saw in some of those clips, genetic research is helping advance the science for many in the rare disease community. Most rare diseases are genetic or have a genetic component. And even though science is advancing extremely quickly, it takes about seven years to get a diagnosis for a rare disease. And a diagnosis does not mean that there is a cure. So without a clear path of medical intervention, how can the medical community support those with a rare disease? Joining me for this discussion, discussion are five amazing individuals, all based in the Austin area. We have Jessica Anderson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ms. Anderson's daughter, Ava, remained undiagnosed for four years before muscle biopsy suggested mitochondrial depletion syndrome. This is considered only a partial diagnosis as a genetic link has yet to be discovered. Ava has an ultra rare genetic variant of uncertain significance, so she must wait for science to catch up to gain more insight. Dr. Danielle Kirkovich is the principal scientist with the Beyond Batten Disease, an Austin-based foundation established to eradicate juvenile Batten disease by raising awareness and funds to accelerate research for a treatment or cure. Dr. Levy is board certified in pediatrics, dermatology, and pediatric dermatology. He has many years of experience in patient care, teaching, and clinical research, and is currently a member of the Pediatric Adolescent Dermatology Service at Dell Children's Medical Center and faculty at the Dell Medical School, University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Levy's special interests include genetic pediatric, general pediatric skin diseases, inherited skin disorders, vascular birthmarks, and clinical research. He has been a strong advocate for patients and the importance of anticipatory guidance as it relates to children's health care. Marilyn Schmeidel, Marilyn's daughter Maddie is 12 and has been waiting for over 11 years for a diagnosis. She's the only known person in the world with her genetic mutation. Marilyn is also a semiconductor engineer at XP. And Dr. Mary Elizabeth Parker. Dr. Parker is board certified in both neurologic and pediatric therapy by the Academy of Board Certified Specialists, which is unique in the field. Her passion is working with those with undiagnosed and rare disorders, and she serves this community through her role as the medical liaison for You Are Our Hope. In addition to rare disorders, her research interests include movement disorders and autism. So we invite your questions all throughout the discussion tonight. Just add it to the chat box. I'll jump in and start though. Um, my first question is for Dr. Parker. As a medical liaison, you've seen many patients go on many different types of journeys to achieve a diagnosis. When you connect with a family early on, what is often the first step for them? Well, one of the things that I think is so important is being able to collect medical records and get them in one place so we can send them out to different research centers. And so I look at this as like throwing out a huge net, like if you're going fishing, um, go and throw out the net and then we're going to pull it back in. And so we're going to take your records and we're going to send them to NIH and TGen and a lot of the other wonderful research projects. We work with Broad Institute um, as well in Boston. So uh, that, that would be the one thing I would say that we do and uh, we help people do. Sarah's muted. Technical difficulties, <laughs> just like in an in real life discussion. Thank you. But I was um, trying to be short, and, and then I was like, and nobody's talking. <laughs> you were so great. We, we were silenced. Um, but I think you, you bring a good point that um, sometimes starting with something simple as just uh, collecting medical records, um, there's also a lot of social emotional needs of families grappling with undiagnosed conditions. Um, so Jessica, you're a parent and you advocate for your child. Um, where do you find support um, for your family? Uh, we um, actually, um, every month we try that we can, we try to join the family meetings for You Are Hope. It's been a wonderful resource. It's been so great, not just for, you know, for me as a parent, 
it's also great for my daughter to connect with, you know, all kinds of other fun individuals um, that have a variety of different conditions, but it's just um, finding solidarity. And there's nothing like being able to connect with another parent who just understands this journey. And I don't know that we would be at this point in our journey um, if it wasn't for your hope. Um, it was meeting another parent. Her daughter had a very similar presentation. We got together, we started having a conversation. And she told me, you know, about this one particular doctor. And that's where we ended up traveling to Houston to go to the same doctor. And that's where we um, found out, you know, that um, Ava has, you know, what seems to be mitochondrial depletion syndrome. We still have yet to really find what is the genetic connection. So that's kind of the next part of the journey. Um, but your hope has really plugged us into, you know, a lot of this other research that we hope to you know, find that out at some point, because, you know, even though we kind of know, okay, Ava's mitochondria are just not, you know, working as well as they could be, you know, for us, finding out the genetic link is a huge part of the picture, because without it, as clinical trials start to open, and, you know, right now there's no cure, but we hope, you know, that there someday will be, and as more um, of these um, treatment options hopefully become available on the horizon, you know, it, it may be limiting if we don't have a genetic diagnosis. Um, so just, you know, parents are just such incredible researchers. And I know that I've had many conversations with Marilyn and, you know, just kind of the best think tank you could imagine. So we're very grateful for you, our hope and, and other parents that are just willing to, you know, walk this journey with us. Um, Mary Alice asked if it's common to wait years for our diagnosis and um, the parents Marilyn and Jessica that you see here have waited for either a partial diagnosis or a diagnosis. Uh, Marilyn, would you like to address that question? Uh, sure. Um, it is common to wait about seven years or more um, for a diagnosis for a rare disease and um, now there, there's a whole exome sequencing is becoming more common. So instead of just picking one gene and testing it, um, we can do all the genes and it's becoming less expensive. So, uh, so diagnoses are coming faster probably than they, than they used to. Uh, but my daughter is still at 11 years testing uh, and it's been really interesting the whole way, but she still ha doesn't have a confirmed diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I um, can speak to my family's journey. We very, very early on, um, were, were we were connected with Dr. Levy, actually, and on our second visit to his office, he said, um, he wrote, I remember he wrote down the name of what he thought um, our condition was, and he said, there's no cure, but there's a very strong community, and I heard that probably in the first couple of weeks of my child's life, and as I've met other parents and people in the rare community, I think this is a very um, rare instance. Not many people experience the, not many people are connected with the community as early on as I was. And so I think it's really helpful to have these kind of conversations so that um, medical students or other people understand that, that the, there's so much value in patient communities because you can talk with other people and learn so much from other people. So Dr. Levy, my question to you is, how did you, how were you introduced to the idea that patient support can often come from outside the walls of a doctor's office? Well, I mean, first and foremost, as I tell all of my trainees, um, uh, probably one of the most important things I can convey to them, regardless of the level of training, is what they don't know. Uh, and, and the flip side to that is where they go for answers. And, and I'll tell you, I, I think for any of us in life, regardless of what you ultimately end up doing, um, it, a lot of that is driven by the mentors we've had. And I will tell you very early in my training, I had wonderful mentors in clinical and laboratory genetics, um, pediatrics in particular. And it was very, very clear from the beginning <clears throat> that uh, with conditions such as we're talking about now, um, engaging uh, patients and families in support groups, uh, if those don't uh, exist, having them, helping them really create those support groups 
um, and uh, and it's it's just totally invaluable. And and I think um, you know, as I mentioned to uh, my colleagues here on the um, on the call with me, uh, one of my you know favorite essays is the for the care of the patient that. Uh, that uh, Francis Peabody wrote in 1926 regarding, in fact, the, um, the, the intent of caring for a patient. And, uh, and, and again, it's trite, it's repetitive, but it is about the patient. Importantly, though, as Sarah pointed out, uh, a, a patient within a family, while one person impacts the lives of everybody in that family, uh, parents, in the case of children uh, with conditions, but also siblings as well. Uh, so uh, I think we're all in this together and, and it's something that I really relish in what I do for a living. I think it's pretty powerful as a patient to hear from um, a care provider that they might not have all the answers and to even be encouraged to seek somebody else's knowledge elsewhere. Um, Dr. Parker, you also work with students. Um, how do you instill this um, philosophy um, with them? Well, I try to include in all of my lectures some talk about the diagnostic journey and differential diagnosis. As a physical therapist, we cannot diagnose, but we can um, serve and really give valuable information to the medical community. So that's what I teach my students. Look, look at your patient and look at what fits the norm of the diagnosis they've been given and what doesn't fit. And we, we talk about um, dump diagnoses. And so a child may be sent to us with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy or autism, but they have all these other things going on. And how do you appropriately refer back to the physician and have that discussion? And so I do that with my students. And then um, as I've done this journey now for gosh, many more years, I also try and go educate other healthcare providers and how to do that in a meaningful way. And so there are tools out there and if we keep an open dialogue, we can do this. Thank you. Well, I mean, I totally agree with that. And, and um... You know, and we spoke about this uh, when we when we met the whole issue of interdisciplinary care. And as you said, and you know, when I circulated the curriculum of the medical school, they have this thread throughout all all years of training, um, as you do uh, within your program that's entitled interprofessional education. And mm -hmm. and all that means, quite honestly, is that we're all in this together. And within that cohort, it's, it's the patient, it's the parent, it's the physical therapist, it's the physician, um, it's, it's uh, Danielle as the scientist, mm -hmm. um, it's people in every discipline who might enter into the care of an individual with whatever the condition is. And it's not about any one of us, mm -hmm. other than perhaps the patient we're talking mm -hmm. about at the outset. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Kirkovich, I, I'm interested in your opinion or observations as a scientist, but you also work at a patient-led um, organization. Um, so can you give us some background about the organization and how um, the patients became involved in seeking their own cure? Absolutely. Um, so I trained as a neurobiologist, but I work at a nonprofit. And the nonprofit I work at is Beyond Baton Disease Foundation, which was founded by Craig and Charlotte Benson after their daughter received a diagnosis of Batten disease, which is a rare genetic fatal illness. And the Bensons, just like more and more stories that we're hearing about, uh, created a groundswell among their community that said, this is not acceptable. And we are going to do what we can within the time and, and the communities we have to change the course of her disease. And that is in fact what they did. Um, so in nine years, they went from uh, knowing very little about this particular disease to filing for investigational new drug uh, designation this past Friday, which will be the first drug for this disease. So I think what it really speaks to is what can happen when you have motivated individuals surrounded by a community. And to echo 
uh, Dr. Levy's uh, sentiment, it takes the government to create incentives for the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceutical industry to take the risk and the patients and the patient families to allow their stories to be told. Um, and the medical students willing to learn from both physicians and researchers. And so it really does take a village upon a village upon a village to get these things done. No one can be an island in this. Marilyn, I understand you led some research for your daughter. Can you talk to us and tell us about that, um, what that was like? Okay, um, I, I'm trying to get out of the the sunlight <laughs> shining through the, the, the beautiful yeah, sundown light on you right <laughs> um, now. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so we started with uh, with a study. Um, Dr. Parker and you are our hope introduced us to a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic, and he. Uh, so it was kind of like a winding road to get there, but um, they did a skin sample on uh, on uh, my daughter. They took a skin sam sample to see if they could find anything, and they didn't. But um, we ended up using that skin sample and sent it to uh, Children's National, who then sent it to University of Brisbane. Um, so it, her skin cells are all over the world. But um, as part of a study from Children's National that's now at, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, they've been looking at this one gene that they think is, uh, is the gene uh, a team in Australia found. Um, they didn't know what the gene really did. Um, so we were pushing for what do we do because they, they did some tests and they couldn't, they still couldn't prove that this was the gene, but they really thought it was. Um, now that genetics is moving so far forward, they really have to prove, you know, without a doubt that this is the cause. Um, probably 15 years ago, they would have just said, this is it. Um, so uh, while they're trying to prove this, um, I asked, what can we do? And the doctor said, they don't have any more tests to do. And I said, if you had money, what would you do? And she said, I would, um, I would make a patient number two. I would make um, a fish or a mouse. And so we, um, we talked to a doctor at University of Utah and he agreed. Um, so we raised the money ourselves to, to make a fish and they used CRISPR. They, um, they changed the DNA of those fish using CRISPR and um, to see if, if those fish would, with your mutation, would have a problem. Uh, they didn't end up having a problem uh, because um, I found a paper that said that it's not a great model, um, but uh, for that type of test. Um, but then uh, out of that, uh, her doctor at CHOP was still trying to help us and, uh, and felt really badly that it didn't work out. Um, and, so she, um, she sent those skin cells um, to the University of Brisbane. They reverse engineered them down to stem cells and then into neuronal cells. Um, and now they're back at NIH and um, they're gonna use CRISPR again and try to edit that gene in those cells. And if they can, the, those neuronal cells don't work correctly um, her skin cells worked fine, but once they backed them up and made them into neuronal cells, like, like kind of pseudo neurons, uh, they had a problem. So they're going to do CRISPR on those cells, fix that gene and see if they, if they improve. And then that would be a diagnosis. Um, it's the NIH, so it takes forever. Uh, it's been a year already since they agreed to do this. Um, but she's, she's had a whole lot of tests and research and every once in a while we're this close and, and just it's been taking a long time but it's really interesting journey I, I'd like to speed it up for her. I'm sure it's frustrating because even though as you said things are moving quickly they still are not moving quickly enough right. um, you know and hearing your story I just am imagining the number of emails and phone calls and communication with so many different people in offices um, so I have a question for everyone. How, how have you found ways to just communicate? And um, do you have examples of positive or negative, but um, positive ways that you've figured out how to navigate these really complex systems? 
Um, I can quickly before, and I'll try not to keep talking. Um, the I read everything I possibly can about about my daughter's um, condition, even though she doesn't have a genetic diagnosis. She has a lot of symptoms, um, and a lot of tests that were a little off. Um, she has a leukodystrophy, but they don't know. They think it's a new one. Um, but I read a lot of papers, and if I find a paper that I found interesting that I think, um, you know, physical therapists and and um, medical professionals who are in school, um, it's a great thing to do. You learn about someone's disease and then read a paper um, from a reputable site um, and look at those authors on that site and then email them. And a lot of times they'll answer and they love talking about their research and it's a great way to learn. Well, I mean, I, I will tell you it's, it's tough. And, and I think it requires, um, for me, a lot of time, the um, undying motivation of parents. Um, I, will, I can't tell you, unfortunately, how many times with, um, with their uh, electronic medical records, you know, you may think, boy, what a salvation that is. But what, what I find happens in that regard, <clears throat> some wonderful intent that I might have or a colleague might have to pursue something that's buried in a note that then you forget about and it's two weeks, two months, two years later and, and you forget. Um, I, I think depending on the problem, um, I, again, I think it comes back to the, you know, the patient, if old enough to take care of his or herself, the parent. Um, and then I find uh, even when I collaborate with, with some of my scientists who don't see patients, if I've sent them material from a patient to study at a molecular level, um, that does take time, as you all know. And, and, and then I, I keep coming back to the families trying to remind me, not trying, they do in fact remind me uh, that I need to contact my colleague. I haven't heard anything and it's like, oh my God, I forgot. I, I just think it comes back to this um, community as I think everyone hears again and again with this discussion. Um, and, and people shouldn't be so shy. I mean, I'll tell you, talk about reading literature on your child's condition. Um, you know, families will call and say, I'm, I'm apologizing. I went to, you know, Dr. Google and I found this. I have colleagues who say they discourage families from going to Dr. Google. I say, that's ridiculous. They're gonna do it. They should do it. It's our job to filter that material. Um, and so I, I just, How's that for a non-answer? But I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, it's tough. And, yeah. um, and, and again, I'll have to tell you in all honesty, for me, um, it always comes down to communication and just being very open and, and honest between each, each other. And if I could echo uh, Dr. Levy's sentiment, some of our best research leads are from the families themselves. You know your kid and you know yourself. And so we definitely learn a lot and spend more time on really good leads from families than, than rabbit trails from other things. I think um, it's actually an exciting time to be in patient community because um, some of these communities such as um, the one I'm involved with, Close Syndrome Communities, actually initiating research and finding funny funding and not waiting for other groups to do this for, for us. And these groups are, and we're able to do that and be empowered in new and different ways. Um, and it's a, it's an exciting time, but it, it is, it can be confusing and overwhelming. And um, these, these advocates and these trusted, you know, care, care providers that we find along the way are so invaluable. So we have a question from the audience. Um, Michael asks, uh, can cloud or distributed computing systems be used or are they being used to help diagnose rare genetic disorders, similar to how they are used to solve complex mathematical or astronomical questions? So I definitely have to um, <coughs> punt to one of our fine panelists to answer that. Danielle, I'm guessing you might have some knowledge in this area. 
Yeah, we do have, we've got had some really fantastic success with some of these prize awards. Uh, the one that comes to mind is Inocentive, and it's a crowdsourced method of throwing a scientific question out there to any community and saying, listen, we're having trouble with this. We don't understand how the protein folds. We need people to work on this project and, and fold proteins until it makes sense. And so there's been a, a great uh, amount of activity in creating algorithms and using uh, cloud-based um, uh, communities to answer some scientific questions, some really big ones. Thank you. Anybody else wanna jump in on, on that? There's another great audience question um, that I'll throw out to our panel. Um, they ask, they imagine that it takes a lot of time and resources to read about rare genetic diseases and receive health care for them. What advice and resources would you recommend families from lower socioeconomic classes use to get help? That's a great question. Um, I think it's difficult for families of all kinds to all kinds of resources to find connections, but um, there's special challenges um, for different populations, if you if English is not your first language, if um, you might live in poverty, or if you don't have transportation, um, that is a huge barrier to receiving um, care. Um, Dr. Parker, as a medical liaison, where do you see um, resources for different families? I was gonna jump in on this one, so I'm glad you asked me. So I think that that is a question we get a lot, and we get a lot of families referred to us who do not have the resources to access um, genetic testing. And so the first thing they need to do is their primary care, whoever they're with, ask them to contact us or contact um, a local parent health group. So for example, in Texas, we have Texas Parent to Parent. And I don't know how big our audience is tonight, but most states have a parent to parent organization and then they can help find local resources. You are our hope is out there. We take care of uh, individuals throughout the country and outside of this country. So we're happy to help. Um, I hope we don't get like 5,000 like um, <laughs> intakes tonight, but um, you need to access your resources and there are people out there and we will find people who speak your language and we will help you find um, access to, to testing. There are so many studies out there and so many groups that are working with genetic testing to make it affordable. And so it is not unattainable. The problem is connection and we can't do this alone. And that's what I say over and over again. Here Our Hope is one group and there are many throughout the country and the world that we partner with. And so just remember you're not alone. Reach out to one of us and, and we'll figure it out. And if not, we'll help you access another group to help you. Yeah, and to, to back up that comment, um, you know, there are 250,000 uh, nonprofits in the US. And yeah. so that's kind of a striking number. Um, but what it is, is what, what we're saying by seeing so many nonprofits is you really have dedicated communities that want to provide that information. Yeah. So what I would say is that in this instance, Dr. Google, Dr. Internet is very good. Um, but it's the same kind of uh, way that you vet anything else. Look for a foundation that has a charity navigator rating, a guide star rating, uh, look for uh, whether or not the information they put on their website is referenced. Do they send you to uh, the Mayo Clinic? You know, uh, do they cite that th where they got the information? And so there are so many nonprofits that are so good at breaking down complex information so that you can understand it and then sending you in really useful directions. And, and I, I will second that as well. And I'll tell you from the from the family support group, the, the disease support groups broadly stated, uh, that is a huge function of their operation. And and I'll tell you for years, which with each of the organizations that I've been involved with, you know, from a language perspective, particularly in this part of the world, 
um, some of the materials have in fact been translated to Spanish, for instance. Mm -hmm. There are families <clears throat> who don't have computers and I will ask people that. And if they say no, I and then ask, is there a library in your neighborhood? And more often than not, there is. And the libraries certainly have computers for use by the public. And, and again, I think it's, it's something that each of us and then other parents um, can help guide these people to the resources that they ultimately need. Keep pushing. And I think in that's a, a good message. And in addition to what has been shared too, a lot of the specialty groups, there is a social worker that is willing to kind of come alongside these families and can kind of help out. And even at Dell, um, uh, Dr. Levy had mentioned the library. At Dell, there's actually a, a library that's inside and there's a dedicated librarian that's willing to help with medical research. I know I had a very specific question and you know, this librarian, God bless librarians, they're amazing. You know, she did this query and gave me all kinds of different resources of places to go to. Um, so it's kind of taking advantage of some of the resources that are there. And, and that's very specific to, you know, here in Austin. But, uh, you know, there are so many dedicated social workers that really know different groups and different ways to, to plug these parents into. People do seem very willing to share their knowledge or help out. Um, sometimes it's just hard to know what words you need to use or the question or how to form the question or who to even ask, who to call in the office to, to talk to. And sometimes those simple, they, they seem simple, but they can provide the most frustration. Um, I think we probably should talk about our current at-home situations right now. Um, this event, as wonderful as an experience as it as we're having right now, um, originally was planned to be in person. Um, thank you, Texas State University, for um, lending us your event space on your beautiful campus in Round Rock. Um, although it's enabled more people to join in that don't live in the Austin area. Um, but I think, I know my group has had several um, online discussions um, I've seen that in the, for different patient support communities, um, just weekly chats, um, just to have people have a, an opportunity to talk with other people who really know what they're going through. So are there lessons that um, we can learn during this pandemic and our new stay-at-home lives from the rare disease community? Um, Jessica or Marilyn has <laughs> any of this, any of your past couple years um, and your prep, the, all the, the work you have to do to keep your ch ch children healthy, um, has it prepared you for what we're living through now? My friend Glenda, she, she did this post. She's like, basically right now we're all living the rare disease life. You know, we have, we don't have a cure. You know, there's um, the need to kind of shelter in place, you know, especially flu and cold season. That's always a big thing for us because what seems like a little small cold is usually a hospital stay in our world. Um, yeah, so I think in some ways we are always expecting the unknown. Ava could be fine in the morning and the evening, you know, she's spiking high temperature and we're, we're at Dell or whatnot. And um, so in so many ways, expecting the unexpected and we never know what tomorrow is going to look like. Like, I think in some ways we're like, okay, there's, you know, changes that we have to make, but we've learned along these, you know, last couple of years of how we just have to be adaptable. And this is all about adaptation right now. And, you know, and I'm sitting from a place of comfort. I have a computer, you know, and I'm self-employed already. So that was already in place. Um, you know, so it, it's definitely a time of challenge for everybody, but I, I do think, you know, I've had a couple of people recently that reach out and they're like, wow, I, I kind of understand the fears and the concerns that you had, they, they thought sometimes in some cases I was being unreasonable or, you know, maybe a little over precautious or, or whatnot. And they're like, well, I really kind of understand, you know, why you were making some of the decisions that you were making, either why we didn't go to a party or why we didn't, you know, do certain things. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm very chatty tonight. So Marilyn, I'll pass it. Oh no, I, you're saying everything that, that I would say. Um, the other, the, the one thing that's different, um, is that I work outside of our home. So, and, and my husband and I work full time. So my, my um, mother-in-law is my daughter's caretaker because she does need someone 24 hours a day. Um, so when we're 
uh, one of us will be home, but she'll be helping. So we'll do like housework and things like that when she's over. And then we'll do our work at other, I'll do my work at other times um, or be at the office. So now uh, we told her she was, she was willing to come over, um, but as often as possible, we're telling her to stay home. So it's much harder. Um, but, and, and then the one other thing that, that we're used to about this is um, supplies because, you know, supplies are, are dwindling now. Um, I, I feel awful for, for children with ventilators because they have to reuse their tubing right now because there is no anything. They're, they All they have is their ventilator. There are no supplies for them. Um, but parents are, are used to um, having exactly the amount of supplies you need from your insurance. And so a lot of times they'll, they'll have groups where parents who've, um, whose children or, or, um, or anyone who's not using supplies that they had, you know, just sitting somewhere, they'll, they'll just pay shipping and, and you can get some supplies just randomly. Um, so parents do that over the years. So we have probably a full month of feeding tube supplies for my daughter just from people who had extras and we just have kept them over the years. Uh, just in case something like that happens. I know there are some feeding tube bags and things like that that are short right now. Mm. So we're kind of used to the shortages. Thanks guys. Um, Dr. Kirkovich, are you still able to do your research right now? Um, congrats on the filing of your patent. The, uh, thank you. So the um, it's it's a new investigational drug uh, approval that we're looking for. So we want to go into trial. Um, we have the patent. <laughs> um, but what I want to say is, you know, right right now we're we're shutting down laboratories left and right um, because people cannot get in and take care of their animals and do their experiments. Um, it has created a situation where there's a full stop in our research, um, but at the same time, there's, there's no shortage of work to be done. So what is in turn happening is people are spending more time on the publications that perhaps wouldn't have come out for two months, they'll come out in a month. Um, collaborations that were put on the back burner and said, okay, we'll talk later, we'll talk later, are now happening through more and more Zoom conferences. So it's, it's not a stop, it's a shift for us. And I think at the end of the day, we're gonna be just fine. It's just gonna iron out. Yeah, and that's, that is so true. I mean, and you're well aware, uh, Danielle, about the, the impact on basic science labs. I mean, that really has come to a screeching halt. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I will tell you the, the arena of clinical research, which is uh, most of what, well, it's all of what I do, uh, that too has had the brakes put on. And it really, it, it, you have to come down on a case by case basis with a given study uh, thinking about, in my world, a child and potential exposure of a child who may have a compromised immune system coming into the clinic to get a, a, a therapy that is not, in fact, proven mm -hmm. uh, and may, in fact, be compared to a placebo or dummy drug to get to the point where you find something that, in fact, does work. So it, it really has... Uh, created um, uh, a, a very interesting, quote unquote, very challenging uh, environment. But as Danielle mentioned, it, on the other hand, has created far more conversation between people than usually exists in many arenas. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be, I, I know this sounds strange, but in some ways, it's going to be a good thing, all of this new collaboration and and speaking to one another instead of being, in a sense, uh, researchers are now less isolated because they have more time to talk to each other. Dr. Parker, um, how are people in your world dealing with um, the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think Jessica and Marilyn spoke to it. I mean, this is the life that they always live about protecting their children. And so what, we have seen um, the, the emails, the posts I get are, this is our life every day. And maybe people will understand it a little bit better when we protect our children or our adults in maybe a little hypervigilant way, some people might think. But 
I, I mean, we have been really, I mean, as a group, we have rallied resources. We are running um, formula and gloves and mat, you know, to our families, those who have it, those who don't have it. So we, we are nurturing our own. I think the undiagnosed and rare disease population was ready for this. And that sounds awful, but I think we were ready. And I just am so proud of how our families have embraced this. And there are, of course, um, different um, risks and challenges. So at least we can be prepared in some ways um, for a time that's very hard to prepare for. Jessica, would you like to jump in? Uh, and it kind of, you know, Dr. Kirkovich was mentioning too, like, you know, the changes that may be coming out of this, you know, a lot of families in the rare disease community, we often have to travel three hours or out of state to get care. And I'm hoping that this will kind of transition to maybe having more telemedicine and more options kind of available um, to lessen some of the hardships, especially the financial hardships. Could you consider, you know, if we go every four months to go see a specialist in Houston, that is the hotel costs, that's the travel expenses, you know, and now, you know, tomorrow we have our first appointment, you know, a telemedicine appointment tomorrow. And I'm, I'm really hoping that this shift will maybe last. I mean, there are going to be things like labs and EKGs, EEGs, all these type of things that aren't going to really translate, but for just the, the check-ins and some of that, I, I am hopeful that there will be some fruit coming out of this challenging season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you regarding telemedicine for sure. I mean, needless to say, that is that is how we're seeing patients now. And I mean, I started doing during, I mean, I came here from Houston and started doing telemedicine there in 2005. And, and it was for a very specific population there, but certainly now uh, it's done much more broadly. And, and to your point, Jessica, particularly with the complex uh, patients for whom travel is an additional hardship, many times it is just not needed. And, and a lot of that absolutely can, and I would argue now should be handled remotely, uh, regardless of where we are. The lab is a whole different issue, uh, but that can certainly be overcome as well. And telemedicine can also op uh, open new opportunities for people who don't have, who don't live in an area where there are a lot of specialists. Um, if you're in a rural community or um, if you have a rare disease, there might be only a handful of people who even know or have ever seen patients with that rare disease. So getting face-to-face -face access is very, very challenging. Well, in um, fact, Sarah, I'll tell you, that was the original intent, period. In fact, that was the only way it was allowed is mm -hmm. if somebody was in a rural location. So when I started in Houston, I, I ended up convincing people that the woodlands, for God's sake, there's nothing rural <laughs> about the woodlands, that that was present the hardship for people to come to the Texas Medical Center. Right. And the it traffic was. alone, the traffic alone. <laughs> yeah. exactly. It was absolutely ridiculous. But now, I mean, it really, it is the thing to do regardless of where you live, period. I just, uh, Sarah, can I just back up, Dr. Levy? I truly, uh, I'm so supportive of this. I remember when I first came to Texas State years ago to, in 2005, we have this big telehealth uh, lab and we were all about doing like remote PT, especially for like cardiac PT. And we were squashed right and left about why would you need to do that? Blah, blah, blah. Well, they live in Bastrop. They live in a rural, they can't get in. And all of a sudden now we're seeing this blossoming of telehealth. So what I hope comes out of this and I just want to reiterate what he's saying. It is, let's use this for the people we can use it for. It's not going to work for everybody. You know, you can't do a lab draw that way, but you can you can do some really valuable treatments. And I can't do every PT treatment that way, but I can do some. And so I have a child who's on a ventilator right now. He can't, I, I, I am not going to go see him in the home for, for lots of reasons, but I'm able to work with his mom and his nurse and we're getting great things done through through telehealth. And so I think in the end, this is gonna have a great 
a great outcome. I hate how we got here. I, re I really, I'm hating it personally, but I think we're learning a lot as the medical community. Mm -hmm. I think that is really uh, such a valuable lesson for us right now and some hope that we can hang on to. Um, it's been great having this audience um, asking questions and thank you for your interaction. A lot of our audience are medical students. So thank you for joining us um, on your evening. Um, we really wanted you, those of you in the medical community to come away with um, a better understanding of how a patient, how their lives, their day-to-day -day lives are, um, what it's like to, to interact with the medical community, what it's like to live with so many unknowns in your life. Um, so my question for the panelists, um, I'm gonna start with Danielle because you're at the top of the screen next to me. Um, if you could give some advice to people starting out in their, as a medical student or in their health career, what would you tell them to empower patients or to have, to help them have a better relationship with their patients? Yeah, I think that, that there has to be an openness and, and a willingness to listen to your patient as being the expert in his or her disease. Um, you know, they may not be an expert in multiple sclerosis, but they're an expert in their multiple sclerosis. Um, and so that communication has to be really important um, to embrace uh, the interdisciplinary um, way of treating your patient. Your patient is not one symptom or one diagnosis. They are um, a very multifaceted individual. Um, when it comes to rare disease and rare disease advocates such as parents, you will never find more resilient, flexible people ever. Um, and then also, I think one of the things that we need as a community and uh, in our interface with uh, physicians in the medical community, not just physicians, to really focus on is finding ways to provide families and affected individuals with not just an interdisciplinary team, but a tour guide. You know, how, what to do first, what to do second, what to do third. Um, just a tour guide as they go through this complex, crazy situation that they never knew existed before they were in it knee deep. Marilyn, what advice would you like to give medical students? Um, mostly just give your patients hope. Um, there, it's so easy. Um, to see different uh, different doctors. My daughter has leukodystrophy, uh, we think. Um, it looks exactly like a leukodystrophy. We just don't have a genetic um, mutation that, that we've proven. Um, but there are so many doctors that tell leukodystrophy patients without a genetic cause um, that they have a lifespan, um, which is in parents just come out crushed. And, uh, and um, the last time that I talked to this panel, um, I mentioned that our doctor, the first time we had an MRI, um, she said she took us in the little scary room. And she said, this is very serious. And, uh, and then she said, uh, we do see patients that have this issue, and, and um, they can get better. And we don't know why. And, and I hung on to that for dear life. I that was, that was the hope she gave me because she didn't have to. Um, so if you can be a cheerleader for your patients and just support them, uh, it'll make a whole world of difference because I immediately said, okay, I'm gonna figure out why there are kids who get better. I wanna know what they're doing and, and what they have because maybe she has it. Um, so just, just be that person who, um, who doesn't say your child is never gonna do this. You can be the person who says, we're gonna take everything that your child has and use it so that they can be the best they, they can be. Jessica, do you have any comments? I love that. Just, you know, the idea of just putting up as much hope there as possible, but also um, one of the things that we have really appreciated about several of our specialists is that they go uh, out of their way to make things easier on Ava. In particular, um, she's got a bone marrow disorder um, as part of her as a part of her overall condition, and we have certain doctor uh, a certain doctor that 
he will help coordinate some of the lab draws so she doesn't have to get poked. I mean, just recently she just had a kidney check, uh, kidney checkup where she actually had to have an IV. And so he put the lab work in so that way she didn't have to get poked in two weeks for the lab draw he had wanted to do. So he was willing to kind of go above and beyond just to make life easier for her. Um, and this is the same doctor, you know, that um, coordinated at the time that she had her tonsils removed, did the bone marrow biopsy. So as opposed to having two surgeries, you know, he had to really deal with the pain of working with, you know, two surgeons at time. It was a lot more logistically challenging, but he did that for Ava because um, anesthesia can be hard on her. And, you know, at the same time coordinating, you know, her tonsils and her bone marrow went on a flight up to the NIH after that to be part of the an NIH study that we're participating in there, but, you know, just that really is willing to help and is just kind about it, you know, even though it might be a little bit more of a, a pain to, you know, coordinate these things, but it makes a world of difference for us as a parent. And especially for Ava, you know, we don't want to put her through a ton of procedures, you know, so if there's anything that we can do to, to minimize that, it's so greatly appreciated. Dr. Levy, since I know you talk with medical students all the time, what are you regularly telling them? Do their homework. Not interacting, do their no. homework. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it's, you heard it all here. I mean, you really have. And I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned, although I think it's implicit in how you all interact with us and uh, and, and, and I, I'm putting you, Danielle, in the us as well and how we interact with you all. And that is, ask the question, what is it you're looking for? What is an important question you need answered? When we finish going through a discussion with a child, if they're old enough to understand it, in most cases, the parent, um, it's like, have I answered a question for you? Okay, yes. Do, what else can I answer for you today? And that doesn't mean you want to extend the visit to three hours. Uh, the parents don't want that, and, and it's not feasible. But I, I, I think just asking simple questions, like, you know, look before you leap, I guess, is, is my advice there. And Dr. Parker? Well, you know, one of the things, one of my basic tenets is honor the journey. And everybody's in their different place whether I am working with a family with a newborn or whether I'm working with a 32 year old or a 45 year old, honor the journey of where they are in this space. And th that's what we have to do. And we just have to be their guide by the side and hold their hand. And it is so hard for me sometimes to not push forward um, in a space, but just honor the journey guide by the side that's beautiful um and is there anything I'm else that say, we want to jump in on one one other thing i will tell you that i i tell the students and 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 i don't care whether it's the students or residents anybody during training is and it gets back to what i said at the outset i don't know all the answers and i like being asked questions from trainees in particular that i don't know the answer to so I really encourage the students in particular early in their training uh, to, to challenge us and ask those questions. And, and again, I think that just is part of the group process, if you will. Thank you. Is there anything anybody would like to add um, that we haven't touched on, maybe that you would like to, to mention? I like that Mary Elizabeth said, honor the journey, because there are times when, you know, if you're being the cheerleader and they're, they're in a place where they don't need that right now, that you have to take kind of a cue from, from the patient or their parents. That's a great point. The patient is the boss. I think something I've heard um, and definitely understand is a parent will know their child better than any specialist ever will, um, especially those with a rare disease. And to really trust yourself and um, trust your instincts and know that there's a lot of people looking out for your child, and, um, but do you know better than anybody else can about a lot of things? Mm -hmm. um, I really wanna thank all of you for participating tonight, both um, our audience and our panelists. This has really been an incredible conversation. Um, this event, like I mentioned, was originally planned to be held in per person, so thank you to Texas State University 
Um, thanks to Marilyn, Jessica, Dr. Levy, Dr. Kirkenjeff, Dr. Parker. Um, she and her organization, You Are Our Hope, have been great partners since we started planning this event last fall. Thanks also to my Austin PBS colleagues, April Burcham, Maggie Schleich, Laura Villagran Johnson, and Susanna Winslow. Um, Austin PBS remains committed to providing safe educational entertainment for the whole family. We're able to provide this valuable service because of the support of donors and viewers like you. So if you're able to today or another time, please make a gift at austinpbs.org slash donate. Um, we provide a lot of support to the community, not, not in the medical way, but um, in educational and connect, connecting ways like tonight. And your involvement and participation is so important. So with that, I will end tonight's screening and discussion. And I will say another thank you and stay healthy to everybody out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. Stay safe, everyone. Good night.